globalization and the Indian economy as consumers in today's world, some of us have a wide choice of goods and services before us. The latest models of digital cameras, mobile phones and televisions made by the leading manufacturers of the world are within our reach. Every season, new models of automobiles can be seen on Indian roads. Gone are the days when Ambassador and Fiat were the only cars on Indian roads. Today, Indians are buying cars produced by nearly all the top companies in the world. A similar explosion of brands can be seen for many other goods, from shirts to televisions to processed fruit juices. Such wide-ranging choice of goods in our markets is a relatively recent phenomenon. You wouldn't have found such a wide variety of goods in Indian markets even two decades back. In a matter of years, our markets have been transformed. How do we understand these rapid transformations? What are the factors that are bringing about these changes? And how are these changes affecting the lives of the people? We shall dwell on these questions in this chapter. Production across countries until the middle of the 20th century, production was largely organized within countries. What crossed the boundaries of these countries were raw material, foodstuff and finished products. Colonies such as India exported raw materials and foodstuff and imported finished goods. Trade was the main channel connecting distant countries. This was before large companies called multinational corporations MNCS emerged on the scene. A MNC is a company that owns or controls production in more than one nation. MNC set up offices and factories for production in regions where they can get cheap labor and other resources. This is done so that the cost of production is low and the MNC can earn greater profits. Consider the following example. In this example the MNC is not only selling its finished products globally, but more important, the goods and services are produced globally. As a result, production is organized in increasingly complex ways. The production process is divided into small parts and spread out across the globe. In the above example, China provides the advantage of being a cheap manufacturing location. Mexico and Eastern Europe are useful for their closeness to the markets in the US and Europe. India has highly skilled engineers who can understand the technical aspects of production. It also has educated English-speaking youth who can provide customer care services. And all this probably can mean 50-60% cost savings for the MNC. The advantage of spreading out production across the borders to the multinationals can be truly immense. Spreading of production by an MNC A large MNC, producing industrial equipment, designs its products in research centers in the United States and then has the components manufactured in China. These are then shipped to Mexico and Eastern Europe where the products are assembled and the finished products are sold all over the world. Meanwhile, the company's customer care is carried out through call centers located in India. Interlinking production across countries in general, MNC set up production where it is close to the markets, where there is skilled and unskilled labor available at low costs, and where the availability of other factors of production is assured. In addition, MNC might look for government policies that look after their interests. You will read more about the policies later in the chapter. Having assured themselves of these conditions, MNC set up factories and offices for production. The money that is spent to buy assets such as land, building, machines and other equipment is called investment. Investment made by MNC is called foreign investment. Any investment is made with the hope that these assets will earn profits. At times, MNC set up production jointly with some of the local companies of these countries. The benefit to the local company of such joint production is twofold. First, MNC can provide money for additional investments, like buying new machines for faster production. Second, MNC might bring with them the latest technology for production. But the most common route for MNC investments is to buy up local companies and then to expand production. MNC with huge wealth can quite easily do so. To take an example, Cargo Foods, a very large American MNC, has bought over smaller Indian companies such as Parrick Foods. Parrick Foods had built a large marketing network in various parts of India, where its brand was well reputed. Also, Parrick Foods had four oil refineries, whose control has now shifted to Cargill. Cargill is now the largest producer of edible oil in India, with a capacity to make 5 million pouches daily. In fact, many of the top MNC have wealth exceeding the entire budgets of the developing country governments. With such enormous wealth, imagine the power and influence of these MNC. There's another way in which MNC control production. 
Large MNC in developed countries place orders for production with small producers. Garments, footwear, sports items are examples of industries where production is carried out by a large number of small producers around the world. The products are supplied to the MNC, which then sell these under their own brand names to the customers. These large MNC have tremendous power to determine price, quality, delivery, and labor conditions for these distant producers. Thus, we see that there are a variety of ways in which the MNC are spreading their production and interacting with local producers in various countries across the globe. By setting up partnerships with local companies, by using the local companies for supplies, by closely competing with the local companies or buying them up, MNC are exerting a strong influence on production at these distant locations. As a result, production in these widely dispersed locations is getting interlinked. Foreign trade and integration of markets for a long time foreign trade has been the main channel connecting countries. In history you would have read about the trade routes connecting India and South Asia to markets both in the East and West and the extensive trade that took place along these routes. Also, you would remember that it was trading interests which attracted various trading companies such as the East India Company to India. What then is the basic function of foreign trade? To put it simply, foreign trade creates an opportunity for the producers to reach beyond the domestic markets, i.e., markets of their own countries. Producers can sell their produce not only in markets located within the country but can also compete in markets located in other countries of the world. Similarly, for the buyers, import of goods produced in another country is one way of expanding the choice of goods beyond what is domestically produced. In general, with the opening of trade, goods travel from one market to another. Choice of goods in the markets rises. Prices of similar goods in the two markets tend to become equal. And producers in the two countries now closely compete against each other even though they are separated by thousands of miles. Foreign trade thus results in connecting the markets or integration of markets in different countries. What is globalization? In the past two to three decades, more and more MNC have been looking for locations around the world which would be cheap for their production. Foreign investment by MNC in these countries has been rising. At the same time, foreign trade between countries has been rising rapidly. A large part of the foreign trade is also controlled by MNC. For instance, the car manufacturing plant of Ford Motors in India not only produces cars for the Indian markets, it also exports cars to other developing countries and exports car components for its many factories around the world. Likewise, activities of most MNC involve substantial trade in goods and also services. The result of greater foreign investment and greater foreign trade has been greater integration of production and markets across countries. Globalization is this process of rapid integration or interconnection between countries. MNC are playing a major role in the globalization process. More and more goods and services, investments and technology are moving between countries. Most regions of the world are in closer contact with each other than a few decades back. Besides the movements of goods, services, investments and technology, there is one more way in which the countries can be connected. This is through the movement of people between countries. People usually move from one country to another in search of better income, better jobs or better education. In the past few decades, however, there has not been much increase in the movement of people between countries due to various restrictions. Factors that have enabled globalization technology rapid improvement in technology has been one major factor that has stimulated the globalization process. For instance, the past 50 years have seen several improvements in transportation technology. This has made much faster delivery of goods across long distances possible at lower cost. Even more remarkable have been the developments in information and communication technology. In recent times, technology in the areas of telecommunications, computers, internet has been changing rapidly. Telecommunication facilities, telegraph, telephone including mobile phones, fax are used to contact one another around the world, to access information instantly, and to communicate from remote areas. This has been facilitated by satellite communication devices. As you would be aware, computers have now entered almost every field of activity. You might have also ventured into the amazing world of Internet, where you can obtain and share information on almost anything you want to know. Internet also allows us to send instant electronic mail, email, and talk voicemail across the world at negligible cost. 
liberalization of foreign trade and foreign investment policy let us return to the example of imports of Chinese toys in India. Suppose the Indian government puts a tax on import of toys. What would happen? Those who wish to import these toys would have to pay tax on this. Because of the tax, buyers will have to pay a higher price on imported toys. Chinese toys will no longer be as cheap in the Indian markets and imports from China will automatically reduce. Indian toy makers will prosper. Tax on imports is an example of trade barrier. It is called a barrier because some restriction has been set up. Governments can use trade barriers to increase or decrease regulate foreign trade and to decide what kinds of goods and how much of each should come into the country. The Indian government, after independence, had put barriers to foreign trade and foreign investment. This was considered necessary to protect the producers within the country from foreign competition. Industries were just coming up in the 1950s and 1960s, and competition from imports at that stage would not have allowed these industries to come up. Thus, India allowed imports of only essential items such as machinery, fertilizers, petroleum, etc. Note that all developed countries during the early stages of development have given protection to domestic producers through a variety of means. Starting around 1991, some far-reaching changes in policy were made in India. The government decided that the time had come for Indian producers to compete with producers around the globe. It felt that competition would improve the performance of producers within the country since they would have to improve their quality. This decision was supported by powerful international organizations. Thus, barriers on foreign trade and foreign investment were removed to a large extent. This meant that goods could be imported and exported easily and also foreign companies could set up factories and offices here. Removing barriers or restrictions set by the government is what is known as liberalization. With liberalization of trade, businesses are allowed to make decisions freely about what they wish to import or export. The government imposes much less restrictions than before and is therefore said to be more liberal. World Trade Organization We have seen that the liberalization of foreign trade and investment in India was supported by some very powerful international organizations. These organizations say that all barriers to foreign trade and investment are harmful. There should be no barriers. Trade between countries should be free. All countries in the world should liberalize their policies. World Trade Organization WTO is one such organization whose aim is to liberalize international trade. Started at the initiative of the developed countries, WTO establishes rules regarding international trade and sees that these rules are obeyed. At present 164 countries of the world are currently members of the WTO. Though WTO is supposed to allow free trade for all, in practice, it is seen that the developed countries have unfairly retained trade barriers. On the other hand, WTO rules have forced the developing countries to remove trade barriers. An example of this is the current debate on trade in agricultural products. Impact of globalization in India In the last 20 years, globalization of the Indian economy has come a long way. What has been its effect on the lives of people? Let us look at some of the evidence. Globalization and greater competition among producers both local and foreign producers has been of advantage to consumers, particularly the well-off sections in the urban areas. There is greater choice before these consumers who now enjoy improved quality and lower prices for several products. As a result, these people today enjoy much higher standards of living than was possible earlier. Among producers and workers, the impact of globalization has not been uniform. Firstly, MNC have increased their investments in India over the past 20 years, which means investing in India has been beneficial for them. MNC have been interested in industries such as cell phones, automobiles, electronics, soft drinks, fast food or services such as banking in urban areas. These products have a large number of well-off buyers. In these industries and services, new jobs have been created. Also, local companies supplying raw materials, etc., to these industries have prospered. Secondly, several of the top Indian companies have been able to benefit from the increased competition. They have invested in newer technology and production methods and raised their production standards. Some have gained from successful collaborations with foreign companies. Moreover, globalization has enabled some large Indian companies to emerge as multinationals themselves.
Tata Motors Automobiles Infosys IT Rand Medicines Asian Paints Paints Sundaram Fasteners Nuts and Bolts are some Indian companies which are spreading their operations worldwide. Globalization has also created new opportunities for companies providing services, particularly those involving IT. The Indian company producing a magazine for the London-based company and call centers are some examples. Besides a host of services such as data entry, accounting, administrative tasks, engineering are now being done cheaply in countries such as India and are exported to the developed countries. The conditions of work and the hardships of the workers described above have become common to many industrial units and services in India. Most workers today are employed in the unorganized sector. Moreover, increasingly conditions of work in the organized sector have come to resemble the unorganized sector. Workers in the organized sector such as Sashila no longer get the protection and benefits that they enjoyed earlier. The struggle for a fair globalization The above evidence indicates that not everyone has benefited from globalization. People with education, skill and wealth have made the best use of the new opportunities. On the other hand, there are many people who have not shared the benefits. Since globalization is now a reality, the question is how to make globalization more fair. Fair globalization would create opportunities for all, and also ensure that the benefits of globalization are shared better. The government can play a major role in making this possible. Its policies must protect the interests, not only of the rich and the powerful, but all the people in the country. You have read about some of the possible steps that the government can take. For instance, the government can ensure that labor laws are properly implemented and the workers get their rights. It can support small producers to improve their performance till the time they become strong enough to compete. If necessary, the government can use trade and investment barriers. It can negotiate at the WTO for fair rules. It can also align with other developing countries with similar interests to fight against the domination of developed countries in the WTO. In the past few years, massive campaigns and representation by people's organizations have influenced important decisions relating to trade and investments at the WTO. This has demonstrated that people also can play an important role in the struggle for fair globalization.